Wonderful. I think we are live now, so thank you everyone who will be joining us throughout the next half hour. Um, we are going to be talking about innovative partnerships for good. Uh, my name is Jennifer Kim Field. I'm the Vice President of Global Partnerships for the UN Foundation. And what we're going to be talking about for this half hour is um, MDG 8, Millennium Development Goal 8, around global partnerships for development and talking about cross-sector collaboration. Um, and how we're going to be sharing sort of success stories of what that all looks like and best practices for supporting partnerships for development. Really excited for the group of panelists that we have on board today, uh, each one who will be a, a great expert around partnerships overall, so I would love to introduce you to them. First off, uh, I'd love to introduce Ido Leffler, co-founder and CEO of UB and co-founder and chief carrot lover to Yes to Carrots. Thank you, Ido, for joining us serial entrepreneur and has some amazing examples of how he's really pushing the needle uh, as it relates to partnerships. We also have Corinne Woods, Director of the United Nations Millennium Campaign, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, Elizabeth Gore, Entrepreneur in Residence of the United Nations Foundation. And then Susan McPherson, Founder and CEO of McPherson Strategies and sort of serial connector as it relates to corporate social responsibility, social media, and doing good. So thank you all for joining us. We're really excited. So Corinne, I would love to start with you um, just to give us the overall broad context of what is so important about Millennium Development Goal 8. You hear a lot uh, two different terms that sometimes are interchangeable but I think are defined in very different ways. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you define global partnerships for development and global partnerships? Okay, let me see what I can do and how helpful that can be. I think on MDGA you have a very specific framing which is MDGA is all about, I'm going to take my earphones off because I get some terrible feedback. Can you still hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I was getting the most awful feedback, so I'm going to actually do it this way instead. Um, MDG8 is known as the age phase debt board. It's all about what do you set up around aid and aid flows, what can be done about trade and the ability to control trade, and what could be done in terms of debt relief. It was very much in that sort of frame and in that sort of context that MDGA was set up and defined. There were also pieces about technology in that, also about particular focus on some of the um, least developed nations. What I think is interesting about where we are today as opposed to where we are as the MDG was created is what we understand to be partnerships goes way beyond the issues of data. It really starts to look at what is the role of very different types of players, multi stakeholders, in bringing about changes on any of the entities. Which means that the role of the private sector, the role of individual citizens, the role of civil society, each has a part to play in bringing about the transformations that we've seen. Now we see that debt relief had a significant impact in a country like Tanzania in terms of the money that was invested in the school. You see the billion dollar debt relief fund that was in Nigeria and has made significant impact. These are things that are fundamental and key, and that whole financing piece, balancing domestic taxation and debt relief and illicit capital flows, is one conversation we have. But I would take you to a conversation that came in the recommendation of the high level panel report on post 2015 that said the transformational shift had to be in partnerships. A new partnership for development which is based on the common humanity and the different roles we can play in bringing the ambulance to the new group. And so when we discuss these things, we could separate out that technical conversation on aid trade debt and a much more fundamental conversation about the idea that we all have a role to play. As our Deputy Secretary Jan, uh, General Jan Elias has said, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And that really is what the partnerships are all about. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Corinne. Elizabeth, talk to us a little bit about the role of innovation and entrepreneurship 
um, given we know that that is a theme and a thread throughout of how all the Millennium Development Goals can be accomplished. So I hope you can hear that. I think we're having a little bit of technical um, issues. But talk to us a little bit about how can entrepreneurs get involved. Absolutely. Well, the UN Foundation hosts um, a significant group called the Global Entrepreneurs Council, uh, of which Ido Leffler is one of the ten members. And there has been a strong commitment, um, I think, for a decade, frankly, of entrepreneurs supporting the Millennium Development Goals, whether it's overt through their business and or it's through their philanthropy or, frankly, their advocacy and education. And so we have found even through significant studies that uh, entrepreneurs are really the source of job creation, of positive global health, of women's economic empowerment, whether you're looking at developing countries or you're, whether you're looking at Silicon Valley. So we are really proud that we've kind of formalized the relationship with entrepreneurs, not only through the GEC, but also through uh, a platform called the Global Accelerator. So anyone can go to globalaccelerator.unfoundation.org and actually pitch their ideas of how they might partner with UN agencies. And on the other side of that, there are significant innovation shops who are scaling the best ideas with partners uh, at places such as UNICEF, the UN Refugee Agency, UN Development Program that have um, labs in environments from New York City to Uganda. Um, there's a new one out here in the Bay Area that's opening at Singularity University. So there's this juxtaposition between innovation, entrepreneurship, and development is getting really strong. And uh, if I can, I'll kick it to Ido Leffler because um, he actually is, is doing that live as we speak with multiple companies. Love to hear just what your examples are through partnership and um, sustainability. Thanks, Liz. Um, I think from my perspective, the most exciting element for entrepreneurs today is the ability to be able to partner with such amazing organizations such as the UNF. We are in a really unique phase in the world today where consumers are looking for companies to have a social mission as part of their core competency. And while we, not, while we might not be able to implement a lot of the actions there, we can definitely help create platforms to fund some of the greatest nonprofits around. And one example of that is our new company, Navy, where through incredible products and an incredible cause, we're able to fund an organization such as the Kids in Need Foundation and provide free school supplies to over 750,000 children. Um, this is something that could never have been done um, decades ago in the speed in which we've been able to do it. The second thing is, is the willingness of larger organizations such as the United Nations and the UNF to partner with entrepreneurs which is something that, I, I, you know, in my personal experience, is very difficult to do up until now. Yet, right now, we can come up with big ideas to the organization to the Global Entrepreneur Council and have those implemented in a way that is scalable, unique, and operationally efficient, which is really, really exciting. Wonderful. Thank you. So we've talked about entrepreneurs and some of the tools that entrepreneurs use certainly are technology and uh, social media, especially new media. So Susan, can you talk to us a little bit about how do they, technology and new media, play a role in supporting global partnerships for development? Well, <clears throat> technology and specifically new media, social media, I liken to almost the glue or the thread that links us all together. And through new media and social media, we are able to use one of the most powerful tools. And it's a tool that's been used for thousands of years, and that is storytelling. Um, it's one that can help communities share stories from around the world. There's no way somebody in a developed country, for instance, is going to truly understand what's happening in a developing nation without seeing stories, hearing stories, viewing stories, and we're lucky that today we live in a world where many of us have that window onto the world. 
So with technology, countries, families, communities can do a better job of capturing and communicating their experiences with others and, and bringing attention to the challenges and, and successes that this, this certainly this um, MDG 8 experiences. It makes global partnerships more personable. It actually enables an entrepreneur to be able to link directly with a social entrepreneur or a partner in you know, 3,000 miles away. Um, and it allows a broader community to be part of these partnerships. It essentially allows us all to be on a similar or same playing field. Can I can I add something to what Susie just said? Just to Please do. the importance of this and how much we at the UN are really fun wonderful. We've just partnered with the humans of New York, which is an incredible global phenomenon in terms of storytelling, putting the voices lifting the voices of individual human beings. We asked him to travel and he's going on a multi-country tour for the UN. And what's been amazing is not just the stories, but the response from that community. We see purified groups with thousands of people commenting, hundreds of thousands of likes, and people really engaging in understanding what it's like to be Iraqi, what it's like to be Syrian in a refugee camp in Jordan, what it's like to be somebody who has felt the impact of war in the Jordan Sea. And this ability of new media to bring together communities to really be part of the solution is something we absolutely feel, and I would strongly support these as one of the major new innovative ways to work together. And Corinne, you bring up a really good point because what you're really talking about is multi-stakeholder multi partnerships. Um, so how can someone from an individual level to an entrepreneur to someone from the private sector? So can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you think multi-stakeholder partnerships will be important in terms of the implementation of MDG-8? Well, I, I think I think we a couple of things. First of all, this very very strong recognition that of course it is a the new the, the new development framework will be signed by member states. So there is a sort of there's a member state responsibility. But changes changes in any country in any society have to be driven by many different stakeholders. And so one of the visions that we have is building on some of the incredible stuff we've seen in terms of every woman, every child, the whole partnership around um, the, the, the child and maternal mortality um, MDGs, to bring people together to play their different roles in bringing about those changes at a national level. One of the things we feel as the UN is important is we start with a common analysis of what the problem is. Why is it in Uganda we're not seeing the rates of maternal mortality um, reducing? What's the bottleneck there? Well, the bottleneck may be a whole roads and infrastructure issue, which is where an entrepreneur can come in and play a different role and be able to actually start to move the, the dial on those things. So one of the things is finding a one a common analysis of the issues and secondly then working to test out different ways of actually addressing some of those issues. So the idea that an entrepreneur, a much sort of larger private sector player, civil society together with government, together with actual individual citizens can come together around a particular issue is something we want to increasingly see and that's really what that idea of that transformative shift is that you see in the high-level panel report around a common humanity and a common analysis. And the question of how to do it, how to do it together, how do you do it in a Tanzania, how do you do it in a Vietnam, how do you do it in a situation like uh, Jordan or Syria or Iraq, these are some of the challenges. But that's the vision, the vision that we're coming together across a, a radically inclusive partnership for the new agenda. Definitely. Elizabeth, uh, do you have anything else that you want to add to that? The UN Foundation has been honored to support the Secretary General's initiative around every woman, every child, as Corinne just mentioned. So anything else that you'd like to add to her points? Yeah, I'll just say that the, in 2010 when the Secretary General made this commitment around every woman, every child, what I think everyone got excited about and why it's been successful is uh, there was, you know, early over 300 commitments to every woman, every child, but the diversity of who was committing is what, what was important. 
So it wasn't just heads of state, you also had companies, you had civil society, individuals. And I think what's really important is the majority of the country commitments were actually from developing countries. Um, so this is not a top-down approach, this is an everyone approach. I think that's been really important, but also accountability. Um, uh, commitments are nothing unless they actually happen. And so uh, there has been systems set up around measurement and accountability through every woman, every child that has been, I think, very important. That if I make a commitment and I stand up and say my company or my country um, or this constituency is going to commit to XYZ vaccines or maternal health support or financial support, that it actually happens and it's measured. So like any business, uh, you need a business plan and a roadmap to accomplish these things that is measured. So that's why I think this has been critically important. But I do not want to underscore the value of the everyday individual and what they can do on this. Um, our chairman, Ted Turner, calls the Millennium Development Goals the world's to-do list. <laughs> and if you just think about what's on your list every day, that you have to accomplish, we all have a pl part to play. And even if you can't leave your town, you have the ability to think about how you can partner and give back. Nothing But Nets campaign, Girl Up campaign, Shot at Life, these are all very simple bite-sized um, commitments you as an individual or your small business can make in partnership with the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, Giving so Tuesday. Yes, Susan, why don't you mention that, because I think this is the next great thing that everyone can contribute to. The, the idea that is, is that there's never been a better time in history for people to be able to connect with their social sphere, whether they live in a small town or that they're an entrepreneur or whether they work for a large organization. Mm -hmm. To be able to spread that word out is easier than ever and to become a global advocate. And some of the stories we hear of people that do come from a small town and all of a sudden have this global reach just through their network um, yeah. is phenomenal. And you can just see what's going on right now with this amazing, um, you know, ice bucket challenge, challenge. that's going on with <laughs> ALS and how wildly that spread. Um, and the notion of Giving Tuesday, which is becoming a global event, and and yep. this is something that the world is able to do, whether you're an individual or a, a, a corporation or an organization, in lightning speed, and and it's remarkable how that can be done. Well, it also shows the power of. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Susan. I was just going to say it also shows the power of large, small individuals, NGOs, corporations coming together um, to, to really make something happen and not just talk about it, but actually do it. Um, so I think that, Susan, that, sorry, you Jen. So, no, this is all good. You guys are um, Who needs a moderator. You guys are all playing off each other, which is exactly what you want in a panel. But I, I want to follow up to what um, you know you just said and Susan as well, which is. What are some um, tips to give to people then on how they would do this? Because, you know, uh, the basis of how the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge went viral, um, you know, it, that's something that is really hard to do and a lot of noise that's out there. So how do you break through that noise and what are some tips that you would give to others in terms of how they would create these sustainable partnerships? So, Ido, I don't know if you want to take well, that first and then Susan? Sure. I mean, there's two separate things I think you're asking. One, how do you build sustainable partnerships? Or are you asking how do you build a creative campaign that can go viral? Let's go with a former first. Okay, got it. Well, I think oftentimes when people sit down at the table to develop a partnership, there is a perceived notion that the the, the corporation, for instance, or the larger body at, at, at the table is the more powerful. And for a successful partnership to take off, everybody has to have equal footing because everybody is providing a very important cog in the wheel. So you just you know put, put off airs and just be at the same wavelength with each of each. Also, secondly, set up your end goals at the beginning. It sometimes seems very 
kind of opposite the way that we think. But think ahead in two years or three years, however long you are planning the partnership, what it does success look like at the end? And then plan backwards with clear assigned goals as to who is going to do what and, and roles, not just goals, my apologies. Every partner within the sphere of the partnership should have a clear delineation of who's responsible for what and probably most important and easy to do because of the technology we were talking about earlier in the chat, that is there should be a constant communication vehicle to track progress on the goals, whether it's once a week, once every month, um, but you have to keep each other accountable. And Elizabeth, you you um, stated that so, so perfectly. Um, and then lastly, I'll say avoid having too many chefs in the kitchen. Partner with as many as you need to make an impact, but don't overdo it. We know that just, you know, you end up just in minutia talk if you have too many people and it leads to people pointing at each other saying, no, I thought you were going to do it. No, I thought you were going to do it. So communication, setting strategies ahead, starting with your end goal and working backwards. That would be my advice. Uh, I would, uh, if I take that more to, to the individual level, or to a, a, an aspiring entrepreneur level. Um, one thing that's amazing is that there are already incredible campaigns out there for you to be able to support. And it's about finding the one that appeals to you, finding one that you can that is, is meaningful and something one that is um, credible and one that you can easily follow. And then being able to build on that campaign. So what we, what myself as an entrepreneur, we're I can't call ourselves campaign creators. What we are, we're someone who we've found organizations that are meaningful to us, whether it was the UNF um, and my, my myself joining the Global Entrepreneur Council and amazing partnerships that we've been able to do with Walgreens and, and, and other organizations, um, all the way through to myself as an individual entrepreneur through UB and Kids in Need Foundation or Yes To with Mama Hope, is we've been able to find organizations that we trust and love we create a campaign that is unique, that will appeal to our um, consumer base. And then um, we leverage the hell out of it um, by telling as many people as we can. And that's what uh, social networks are there for. That's what a consumer base is there for. And as an individual, whether it's my wife and I, um, just a, you know, when in history, again, would my wife and I together have a collective social reach in the thousands or tens of thousands? And you often see that with people just in their local communities being able to develop that forward. So pick an organization that you trust and then tell the world about it. Yeah. Can I, can I add something which I think is really interesting? We talk a lot about it's very often possible to be at the table on a something, you know, to do something small. and. But there's something very wonderful about walking through the door and going all the way through into really wanting to engage and leverage the hell out of something, as Ida just said. There's something really extraordinary about that. And so we often talk with partnerships is, yes, be radically inclusive, almost have as, you know, let's make sure we work with as many people as possible, be as promiscuous as possible. But there's something extraordinary about when an individual or an organization lands on something and says, we're going to go all the way through this. We're going to go 100% and leverage all our assets and our abilities to bring about to the thing that we care about. And when you have, in a partnership, you do that, we see the most incredible changes happening and the most amazing things happening. I mean, I just hear from, we have you know, one young man in India who decided on the My World survey he was going to do it. My God, the guy has brought in 100,000 votes from people in India. He just said, I'm going to mobilize. I'm going to get all these textbooks to do it. So I'm going to get in touch with the people who produce all the sci scientific and engineering textbooks. I'm going to bring about 300 friends who are going to give up their pocket money to go out to communities. When you see that happening, someone doing that, that's the most wonderful and beautiful thing. So sometimes walking through the door, which might be a nice bucket over your head, but all the way through to the point where you can really leverage your assets is an amazing thing to do. And I would urge people to think about how do you do that and how you start from your ice bucket and end up making the sort of impact which really can see how you're delivering the change in the world. Thank you, Corinne, for that. I think what you just pointed to is really um, what is the call to action for, for those that are out there on how can you make um, 
the biggest and best uh, partnerships that you can, both at the individual level, using social media, um, and how to use your networks and, and Edo's word, leverage the heck out of um, things. So I would love to call upon our uh, panelists in the few minutes that we have remaining. What other calls to action do you have for everyone in terms of how we can do things um, bigger, better, be much more impactful by partnering with each other, whether it's through models like Every Woman, Every Child, which is a multi-sector partnership, or whether it's you as an individual who have your own network to be able to spread the word and raise awareness and get people engaged. So Susan, I'd love to start with you if you have any last minute words and call to action to people. Well, I think most importantly, and I, I say this often, we need to listen more than we speak. And I think it's really important to think about your own individual networks and look around and do some, some deep dives into finding out, knowing your network, what can you do with them to make positive change? Um, I also think, again, what in the end are you going to be most excited about that you will continue to work on and not give up when, when the challenge gets difficult because we all know that many months of working on something you tend to maybe kind of lose interest. What is going to keep you the most focused that's going to allow you to see the, the results or the fruits of your labor over the next four to six to eight months that it's going to take to get the job done? That would be just quick little tips. Wonderful. Thank you. And what about you, Elizabeth, as the entrepreneur in residence? You know, entrepreneurs always have really big ideas and lots of ideas. So. Any thoughts um, around uh, advice that you would give in terms of how to build? Sure. I always talk about the triple bottom line um, because entrepreneurs are always looking at not just profit but people and the planet, and they seem to understand that first and foremost. Um, so what, what might surprise people is you might already be making a substantial impact uh, through your business, through your employee, employees, through your supply chain. Uh, but maybe you might package it differently and make a commitment around that. Um, but most of all, it's, it's raise awareness. You know, if you can educate your employee base, your customers, um, through marketing, cause marketing, um, and through your own, most entrepreneurs have big followings, as Ido said. Um, there's very simple messaging uh, that you can make that will um, raise awareness and raise the bar. So. And if you have a big idea on partnership, we have an area that you can actually pitch us um, on the Global Accelerator uh, of what your company might do. So we're listening, I think, is something really important to end on here. Wonderful. And Ido, last but not least, um, as um, someone who does this every day, any last minute thoughts? It, well, it's simple. That If a schmuck like me can do it, anybody can. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, this is this is not. You know, I, I think we're in the world today where making a difference is is easy. You've just got to, as you said, Corinne, you've just got to step through that door. You've got to take the first step, and it's super. Um, in, you know, as a dad, I can say that it's the most rewarding thing in the world to be able to show my kids not what my companies sell, but what they do, and. As an individual and as a dad, that's the greatest reward you could possibly want, um, I, I think, um, it, as, as a legacy as you, as you live through your life. And I think that the world organizations such as the UNF have made it easier than ever to make that difference a reality, and, and we're very fortunate to be in that position. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank all of you, um, uh, our, our panelists, for spending this half hour talking about global partnerships for development and global partnerships. And those who have um, chimed in as well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. And it's all about saving lives and make or making greater impact, accelerating as much progress as possible towards the MDGs. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you you thank did a fabulous you. job. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.